Welcome to Teaching the Truth with Pastor Eric C. Bogan. Clearly define what I am to do. Let every word penetrate the heart. Let what is said lead them running to your arms. Use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. And that's what I want to talk to you today about. How to receive the Spirit. How to receive the Spirit. Turning your Bibles to John chapter 20. This is Pentecost Sunday, in case some of you did not know what you run into. You just ran into a Mack truck. I don't know if you're visiting today, but you just ran into a Mack truck. Hallelujah. The power of God is... It's about to go from heart to heart and breast to breast. And I don't know about you, I'm not content with the Spirit being with me. I want the Spirit, you got it in me. I'm not content with merely being in the presence of God. Oh, his, oh the Lord's presence was there, amen. But is he there, here? You gotta, you gotta, you gotta want it. And we'll talk about it. John 20, John chapter 20 and verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, breathed on them and said unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Receive it. Now, some of you may be wondering, I mean, why did he breathe on them when he was trying to minister to them the Holy Ghost? Because in the Greek language, which the New Testament was originally written in, wasn't written in English, it was written in Greek. In the Greek language, the word spirit and breath is the same word, pneuma. So it made for a perfect picture. When he breathed on them, that was a metaphor for them receiving not just his breath, but the spirit that was inside of him. Because the Bible records when Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit descended like a dove and it went into him. That's why he did what he did. The miracles he did. The Bible says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed of the devil. People think that Jesus did what he did because he was the son of God. No, he did what he did because he was filled with the spirit of God. And that is to teach us that we'll be able to do what he did and even greater works if we receive this spirit. But notice he says to his disciples, he gives not only breathes on them, but he gives them a commandment. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. See, God's breathing, but is anybody receiving? God's all in some of our faces, just breathing, 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 but we won't receive. It wasn't enough for Jesus just to breathe on them. They had to receive it. The interesting thing about this word receive here, it means to take with the hand. The word receive means to take into your hand. So a literal reading of this is take the Holy Spirit into your hands. 
Now, we know that that's not uh, possible, literally, to take the spirit with our hands. He's a spirit. He's invisible. You, you can't take him with your hands. So an alternate reading of this uh, particular verse would be this. Accept the Holy Spirit into your heart. You may not be able to take him with your hand, but you can accept him into your heart. Besides, the Holy Spirit doesn't want to live in your hand. He wants to live in your, live in your heart. We might also say it this way. Make room for the Holy Ghost in your life. Jesus breathed on them and he says, move everything out the way and make room for the Holy Spirit in your life. The point Jesus is making here is this. Receiving the Holy Spirit is not a passive thing. Receiving the Holy Spirit is not a passive thing. Too often we treat receiving the Spirit, receiving the Holy Ghost as something that happens to us rather than an experience we're expected to act on, to take with the hand. Go to John chapter 7. We treat receiving the Spirit as something that happens to us. We're taking too much of a passive approach. Oh, Lord, just, you know, fall on me. Well, amen. When he does, what are you going to do? I didn't think I needed to do anything. Well, that's what this sermon is all about. See, we, we think all we got to do is be in a room and it fall on us. Oh, there is this going to happen? No, 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 no. It will fall on you and run off you like water off a duck's back. Some of us are umbrellas instead of vessels. We're in the rain, but it's running off our backs. Don't be an umbrella today. Be a receptor. Learn to receive. Take with thy hand. Take into your heart. Make room in your life for the Holy Ghost. Stop taking this passive approach. John chapter 7 and verse 37. John 7 and 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has says, out of his belly shall flow rivers of what living water. Verse 39, but this spake he, not of rivers, but of the spirit which they that believe on him should receive, should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. And that last phrase simply means that you can't receive the Holy Ghost because Jesus had all the Holy Ghost. You had to wait till he get out, got up and said, okay, I'm done with it. Now you can have it. He had it all. All right. But he don't have it all anymore. You need to go get you some. I said, you need to go get you some. How do I get some? Well, again, you don't get some by just being in the room and being breathed on. Notice Jesus says in verse 37, meaning he didn't say in verse 37, come unto me and be filled. He didn't say, come unto me and get wet. He said, come unto me and drink. There's a difference between coming and drinking and, and, and coming and being filled or coming and getting wet. We got wet today. That's the problem. We're wet, but we ain't drinking. If you're coming to be, coming to be filled or just to get wet, then you're probably taking too much of a passive approach. Uh, to receive in the Holy Ghost. 
You're waiting on something to happen to you. You know, when we think about coming to God and be filled, coming, I'm coming to the altar to get filled. Well, that's too passive. Let me, let me offer you an idea. If you drink, you'll get filled. See, we have this idea that I'm not, I'm not saying that the Holy Ghost doesn't want to fill you. I'm just saying it's not like you might think. You're not like a vase, you know, he's just going to fill you. No, no, it doesn't work like that. You have to cooperate. You have to be engaged. It's not something that happens to you. It's something that you get involved in the process. When you talk about drinking, you're talking about being active. Drinking is not something that can happen to you. I can't come up to you while you're sitting and then, you know, just make you think drink without you being involved. I can pour water on your head. I can pour it on your head. I can even I can even dunk you in water. But if that water is going to get inside of you, if it's going to get in, it'll come all on you. And you'll, you'll run around this church and you'll roll. I was going to say roll under the pews, but ain't no pews. I mean, some of us be hard pressed to get underneath these chairs. We may not get out. We'll be walking to our car with a chair on our back and be stuck. Yeah, he can come on you without you getting involved, without you drinking. But if he's going to be in you, you got to drink. Say, I got to drink. And drink, drinking is a voluntary act. It's not involuntary. I think some of us think that, you know, we're going to just hook you up to a bunch of uh, tubes like they do in a hospital and just give you, you know, intravenously, you know, just kind of pump it in your body. No, that's not going to happen. I don't care how many times pastor lay his hands on you or somebody else lay their hands on you. You, you don't get the Holy Spirit intravenously. You're tapping for a vein. You know, anybody's going to tap for no veins over here. I said they're not going to tap for uh, any veins to, to hydrate you. You're going to have to do it the old time way. I know we got modern medicine, but when it comes to the Holy Ghost, you got to do it the old time way. Before there were needles, tubes, and all this other stuff. If you wanted to get hydrated, you had to open your mouth. 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 I know your ears are open, but is your mouth open? You know, just saying that is, is, is already intimidating some people. Because for whatever reason, you, you find it hard to take on the, the approach and the mindset where you're just going up to God and taking stuff. You know, they, you just, you know, I, I remember there was a, a member, there, there was a member here in our church and um, their wife was just really new to, you know, church and all that. And, uh, you know, I'd say, well, I invited him over to the house. And they're going to come over to the house. And he t told his wife, and she says, you can't go over to the pastor's house. You can't go over to the pastor's house. You can't go over there. Because she has this idea that that's something you don't do. People take that approach when it comes to God. You can't just be going up there and taking with the hand. You don't do that with God. I, I didn't think he invited me. I, I, they just, they when they think about engaging and interacting with God, people naturally have this just real docile, passive mentality that they're just to stand there and let God do, do stuff. They, they've never thought about, man, I have to engage. God inspects me to take with the hand. God expects me to drink and open my mouth. He expects me to take initiative to get involved in the process. Absolutely. 
because that's exactly what he expects you to continue to do once the Holy Ghost comes inside of you. We're receiving the Holy Ghost not so that we can feel a part of the group, not so much so we can, you know, feel good in our, in our bodies. We're receiving the Holy Ghost because we want the Holy Ghost to use us. And when the Holy Ghost uses you, he doesn't open your mouth. He doesn't move your hand. He works with you. You're going to have to be involved. So God makes that, you know, a part of the initiation. Is your involvement. But again, I know that some individuals just have a tough time. You just overall have a tough time in taking this kind of, for the lack of a better word, aggressive approach. You know, it, it feels very forward. And so I got good news for you. God's got another way for you to receive. Go to Luke chapter 11. God is so interested in you receiving this gift that if, if you can't receive it the conventional way, he's got a back door for you. Hallelujah. I said, I got good news for you. There's another way to skin this cat. You're going to have to get involved, but it's a less direct approach. Well, let me just share it with you here in Luke 11, Luke 11, verse 5. And he said unto them, Jesus is speaking to the disciples. He's going to give them a parable. He says, he said to them, which of you have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine is in his journey, has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within, that is the friend, he from within shall answer and say, trouble me not. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed, and I cannot rise and give you. Verse 8, and I say to you, though he will not rise and give him because he is a friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needed. The literal translation is he will give him more than what he needs. Oh my goodness gracious. Now in this story, in this parable, Jesus is trying to teach his disciples the power of persistence. In this story, a man, he goes to the house of his friend, take note of that, the relationship, his friend asking him for loaves of bread. That's an important detail, that he asked his friend for loaves of bread. It's not important to understand the parable Instead, the bread, the detail of the bread is important if we're going to understand everything Jesus was saying to his disciples in this whole discourse. See, this wasn't the only thing Jesus said. He, he, he continued to say some things. In fact, if we, um, if we uh, jump down to verse 11, he says, if a son... If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? If a son shall ask what? Bread of any of you that is a father, will you give him a stone? So here, Jesus is basically saying the same thing, only this time, instead of a man asking a friend for bread, we have a son asking a father for bread. Ah, there it is, a connection he's making here. And, and Jesus is trying to, the reason why the man in the first story wasn't asking his friend for, uh, say, water or some other commodity, the reason why he asked him for bread is because Jesus wants us to combine these two stories. And notice 
he climaxes this whole conversation with his disciples with what he says in verse 13. Look at verse 13. If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? There were two people asking in, in, in this discourse Jesus was having with his disciples. There was a, a man asking a friend and a son asking a father. But they both received the same thing, bread. But they didn't receive it the same way. If you look at these two stories together, you'll notice that we, we're being shown two separate approaches to receiving from God particularly receiving the Holy Spirit. First, we're shown a persistent friend receiving bread. Second, we're shown a son receiving bread. And again, even though these are two separate examples, in the end, they both received what they needed. And I think this is what God is, Jesus is trying to say. I wish you would come as a son. And what, what does it mean to ask the father as a son? Notice Jesus didn't say, if any of you have a child. He didn't say that. If any of you have a son. Now, we don't make a, a real distinction between a child and a son other than the sex of that particular child. But in the Greek, there is a major difference between the word child and the word son. When the Bible uses the word child, it's talking about someone who's immature. When the Bible uses the word son, he's talking about someone who is mature, who has a mature relationship with his father. And so you know what he says here when he talks about a son asking a father for bread? He says, that's a mature way of asking the father. It's going up to him and believing and trusting that when you ask him, he's going to give you what you want. It's, it carries the idea of what we talked about in John 20, where you take with the hand. You ever see a son who has a, a real strong and healthy relationship with his father? You don't see this, oh, please, daddy, please, please, please. My son, just the other day, you know, he was, you know, because gas prices are so high. You know, he, his car is a gasoline powered car. I have an electric powered car. So he, he wanted to run on the other side of town, and instead of taking his car, he said, oh, Dad, I'm, grabbing the, I'm taking the car. I'm taking the Tesla over to... I said, well, okay. <laughs> I mean, he, didn't, he, didn't really, he just grabbed the keys and started heading out. You know how they do. They start walking out. I'm, I'm headed. I'm taking the car. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't say, let me drive the car. I'm taking the car. Because mm -hmm. somebody said, that's a son. A son... A son doesn't knock on the door. A son comes in the door and takes what he wants. That's how God wants us to be. He wants us to be in a relationship with him where we're not always knocking on the door, knocking on the door, knocking on the door. Hey, I'm outside. Hey, I'm outside. Can you please help me? Can I, can I get a little help? I would, really would like the Holy Ghost. I really would like just come in and take it. You see it all I got. I got bread everywhere. I just got it. Just, if you need some, just come and get it. Mature sons understand that, that God doesn't have to get out the bed and come and, and feed you. He's already made it all available. He said, come unto me and drink. It's already, I put it in here for you. I'm not drinking the Holy Ghost. This Holy Ghost is for you. I remember when my kids were small, you know, we bought them little Kool-Aid things. I mean, I don't drink them things. Those are for them. Go in there and take it. In Mark eleven twenty four, 24, let me read it to you. Here's a son. Here's a son talking here in Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore, I say to you, whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them and you shall. That's a mature approach. That's what sons do. Whatever they want, they ask. And when they ask, they believe they take with the hand. Take into their heart. 
And they have it. But if you're struggling to come to God as a son, you're struggling to take the Holy Spirit by faith, then let me suggest to you another option. Come to him like the man in this parable. This man in the parable, he didn't come uh, to his friend as a son. He didn't see himself as a son. He didn't, he didn't see himself as having the right or the privilege of just coming in and receiving. He, you know, there's some people here today, despite the fact that you are born again, blood washed, and God has said that you belong to me. You still have a hard time believing that. At most, you can believe that you and God are bros. Y'all dogs. That's my friend. That's my buddy. I mean, I can't really walk in his house, but, you know, I, I, I can show up. He might let me in. We take this approach. We, we just, you know, we, we're, we're kind of like we're, we're not really confident as it was. He says, if you can't be like the son who believes you receive, be like the man in the parable. Because this man in this parable, even though he didn't see himself as a son, he had one thing going for him. Importunity. Look at verse 8. Luke 8. Luke 11 and 8. I'm sorry. Luke 11 and 8. I say to you, though he will not rise and give him because he is a friend, yet because of his what? Importunity will he rise and give him as many as he needed. We don't use that word importunity a lot. Some of you, it's the first time you may have heard it. Let me tell you what it means. The word importunity means to be shamelessly persistent. The word importunity means to be shamelessly persistent. Shamelessly persistent. Not just shameless, not just persistent, but shamelessly persistent. Someone who is shameless is someone who's not afraid to ask. And they're not afraid to ask more than once. You know, if you see these stories, these individuals, I mean, it's a high schooler asking some, some celebrity to go with them on their prom. You're like, what are you doing? And they end up going. He's like, what? They actually went. That's because they were shameless to ask. They wrote them 15 letters. They got on Facebook. They got on Instagram. They didn't care what, they, you know, most of us, we would be too embarrassed to do that. We would be too shame. Oh, that's shame. I would, I'd be too scared. They, these folks ain't scared. They're shameless. Have you ever ran into a shameless person? They'll just ask you stuff. Oh, oh, did you do your own hair or did someone else do that? You know, <laughs> you've got some nerve. You've got some nerve. Shameless. Shameless. These aggressive, how many, I'm saying, have you ever met these shameless people? And, and these people, they are so aggressive. They just have so much nerve, and then in, they end up going to the prom with the prom queen. And they look horrible. Their mama don't even drop them off in front of the school. She drop them off at the block up behind. Make them walk. She's ashamed of them. But look at them, you know, snag a tea, tooth, and just looking crazy. Acne all over, doesn't matter. They're walking with the most beautiful woman in the school. And he says, you went with him? He asked. Nobody else asked. And the first time he asked, I was like, no, I ain't going with him. But he kept showing up at my house. He kept texting me. He kept DMing me. Whatever. What is that? 
instant man, whatever that is. He kept doing it. Shame, somebody say shameless. shameless. Someone who's persistent is someone who refuses to be denied. In fact, they believe that they won't be denied as long as they don't stop. They believe that if they just keep asking you, eventually you will tell them yes. They believe they can win by attrition. Just get on your nerves. It's okay if you will just stop talking. So they got the nerve to ask and they're persistent to keep asking because they know you're going to budge. You're going to give in. You will finally give it to him. And he says this. If you're not confident in yourself, at the very least, be shameless and be persistent. Get rid of the shame. Stop taking no for an answer. I don't know where you are. You know, some of you, I know, look, you've been at this many times. Many years you've been trying to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You've asked God to fill you more than once. And you're thinking now, I don't know if I can bring myself to go back down there another time and be disappointed. Mm, you got to get that shame out of you. Because the people you think are looking at you, they ain't looking at you. They trying to figure out how can they get in on this too. See, you're worried about what other people are thinking when the fact of the matter is they're not even thinking about you. In fact, they think you already had it. The many times you didn't come down there, they think, oh, they already feel, they already, you know, they, they feel like they're the one left out. They feel like I'm... Come on, somebody. And I'm not saying that, that, that there aren't individuals here who've been laying before God, who've been consecrating and fasting, and you got up this morning and you had no doubt. I said, you had no doubt in your mind. And Pastor, you can keep, you keep talking. I mean, I'm just like ready. They were, you were ready when you woke up this morning. Matter of fact, you were ready last night. And you don't really need a whole lot of prepping. You don't really need a whole lot of priming. You just need an opportunity. I just need an opportunity. Just open the door. I'm going to go get it myself. I don't need, I don't need a guide. I don't need somebody to hold me by the hand. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need any of that. I already know. I'm already ready. My mind is set. I just, I just need an opportunity. I just need you to say go. But then there's some people here, as I said, they're not in that place. No matter how hard you try to, you know, get yourself up to that place of faith, you're just you're at this place and this, this point in your walk with God, you just don't feel that kind of, you know, initiative. But again, let me offer to you, there's another way. He says, if you being evil will give in to people who are persistent with you, people who have the nerve to ask you how much more. Because while you may have had to convince your friend, you may have had to convince you know, someone else on your job, you don't have to convince God. He's ready. He wants to give it to you. But he's only interested in giving it to people who want it. Because the Holy Spirit is precious. 
God's spirit is not just holy, he's precious. And he don't want you to leave it on a seat when you leave church today. He's only interested in giving it to those who hunger and thirst. And I want you to understand, those of you who are coming to receive the Holy Ghost, that it's going to take some action on your part. If you come to receive the Holy Spirit, don't just stand there, you know, like a statue, waiting on God to do something. You do something. Either take it by faith and receive it into your heart and say, I have it in Jesus' name. Or you get on your face and just keep asking him. And don't be afraid to cry out loud. Be shameless. I need it. I need your spirit. And I know I came three months ago. I'm coming again. I'm coming again. I'm coming again. I'm come, I made up my mind. I'm going to keep coming. I'm not going to quit. And those are the people that I want to invite. That God's inviting. That God is offering the gift of his spirit. Mm, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Give me what to say. Let me hear you. Thank you for listening. If this teaching has been a blessing to you and you'd like to partner with our ministry to share the message of Jesus Christ, please visit our website at www.hmclive.org and click the donate button. If you're in our area, we invite you to join us at 4317 Lippincott Boulevard, Burton, Michigan, 48519, Harris Memorial, Church of God in Christ, teaching the truth, and showing the love. Use me, Lord.